Hey there, this is Am Kay. Thank you for watching part 6B of my series into the Benoit family murders. Part 6 needs to be broken down into as many parts as it's going to take for us to get through all of these crime scene unit reports. So you know the drill. Give me a thumbs up and subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, why not subscribe? And share this with anybody that you think might be interested. The more eyes on this, the better. Let's get people to start asking more questions about this. I think it deserves it. What do you think? Leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. I really am enjoying reading everybody's thoughts. It's really motivating actually to keep me going and putting this out there for people to see. But blah blah blah, we've got a lot to get into, so let's get to it. I also just would like to take a minute to say I will never put any of my research behind a paywall. I believe information should be free and easily available to everyone. However, if you are able to give and you would like to contribute to my little channel, I am adding a link to my Cash App in the description box below. Any little bit will be greatly appreciated and will go a long way. Please leave a contribution in the description box. All right, and in the last part, we looked at Lieutenant Trey Powell's crime scene unit report, and today we're going to look at the three investigators who worked with Lieutenant Powell collecting evidence. Investigator Rojas, Investigator Harris, and Investigator Russell. So here we go. Okay, and the next supplement report we are going to look at is from, let's see, there's no name at the top, but when we scroll down, this is from Investigator Manuel R. Rojas. And Mr. Rojas says in his narrative, on June 25th, 2007, at approximately 1500 hours, which would be 3 o'clock p.m., I responded along with Lieutenant Powell and Deputy Sergeant Russell to 130 Green Meadow Lane, Fayetteville, Georgia. Upon our arrival to the incident location, I observed multiple Fayette County Sheriff's Office vehicles outside a closed and secured gated fence. That fence really bothers me. We met with Lieutenant Pope, who advised us of the incident and led us to the locations where the bodies were found inside the residence. I began my duties by photographing the exterior and interior of the residence, focusing on the entry slash exit doors using a digital camera. I entered the residence through the west side entry door near the garage and followed Lieutenant Pope upstairs to the bonus room slash office above the garage and observed victim number one, later identified as Nancy Benoit. Mrs. Benoit was located in the front right corner of the room. The victim was laying in the prone position, covered with a red patterned blanket, with only her head and feet uncovered. A Bible was found positioned to the right side near her upper torso. Advanced decomposition was present in the face of Nancy Benoit. Continuing from the bonus room, we followed Lieutenant Pope to an upstairs bedroom located on the right side of the residence, where the second victim was located. The second victim was later identified as Daniel Benoit. I observed the child on the left side of his bed in a prone position, fully clothed with his head on the pillow. The victim was wearing a blue long sleeve shirt and blue in color pajama pants. The child victim was holding a small red in color bear in his right hand. Also to the right side of the victim, a child's Bible and two Winnie the Pooh bears were found. The child's body appeared to be in a sleeping position. We continued to a basement gym on the left side of the residence where the body of the third deceased person was located. The deceased person was later identified as Chris Benoit. I observed Chris Benoit in a sitting position facing in a southern direction. His left leg was extended to his front and his right leg was bent at the knee with his right foot under his left thigh and knee. Both arms were in a downward position, slightly bent at the elbows. He was sitting in front of Magnum Fitness Weight System. Chris Benoit was being held in the sitting position by a black rope around his neck. The rope passed through a set of pulleys and then attached 
to 150 pounds of the fitness system weights supplemented by two 40-pound dumbbell weights on top of the system weights. The weight was in a lifted position and kept in that position by the weight of Chris Benoit's body. It appeared that a strip or piece of a white towel was placed around the neck prior to placing the black rope around the neck. The black rope was attached to itself by a metal carabiner at the area around the neck. You know, that's one hell of an elaborate suicide contraption for somebody that they claim had brain damage so badly that he didn't know what the hell he was doing. Just saying. I began my duties by photographing the exterior and interior of the residence, focusing on the entry slash exit doors. I found that only four entry slash exit doors to the residence to be unsecured. On the left side or west side of the residence, I found the side entry slash exit door to the residence unsecured the garage entry slash exit door to be unsecured, and of the two roll-up garage doors, I found the left roll-up door to be partially opened. At the rear of the residence, on the right side of the deck, I found the entry slash exit door entering into the kitchen to be unsecured. Now, <laughs> maybe somebody snuck in that door and did all the dishes? I'm referring to part four, link below. All other doors were found to be locked and secured. I concluded my duties at the scene by assisting Deputy Sergeant Russell and Deputy Sergeant Harris in collecting evidence from the upstairs bonus room office. End of the report signed by Investigator Manuel R. Rojas and approved by Lieutenant Trey S. Powell. Okay, and next we're going to look at the report by crime scene technician Deputy Sergeant J. Russell, and this report date is June 25th, 2007. On the above date at 1450, which would be 250 p.m., I, along with the rest of the crime scene unit, was requested by Detective Harper to be en route to 130 Green Meadow Lane, Fayetteville, Georgia, 30215, in reference to a suspected murder slash suicide. When I arrived on scene, I followed Lieutenant Powell in the side door located to the right of the garage and into the kitchen. There, Lieutenant Pope told me that Nancy Benoit was lying on on the floor in the bonus room on the second level of the residence above the garage. Daniel Benoit was laying in his bed in his bedroom on the second level of the residence, and Chris Benoit was in the gym downstairs hung with a wire from his workout equipment. The first body I viewed was that of Nancy Benoit. She was in the bonus room lying on her stomach with her head facing to the left and a blanket covering her from just below her shoulders down. Beside Nancy's head on the right side, there was a red in color Bible. Nancy had what appeared to be a coax cable around her neck. Underneath the coax cable around her neck was white rope. See Lieutenant Powell's narrative for further description of the body. And we went through Lieutenant Powell's report in the first part of part six, part six A. The second body that I was led to was that of Daniel Benoit. Daniel was located in his bedroom on the second level of the residence above the master bedroom. Daniel was laying on his stomach in his bed and appeared to be in a position that he was sleeping peacefully with no signs of a struggle. So what about that cross face? Daniel's face was turned to the right, and beside him was a children's Bible. Daniel did have some white froth coming from his nostrils, but no apparent signs of trauma. The body of Chris Benoit was in the gym downstairs underneath the kitchen. Chris had the wire from a... Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that, a Nautilus workout machine around his neck that was attached to the weights. I wonder if he meant Nautilus, perhaps, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. On top of the weights were two 40-pound dumbbells. Underneath the wire around Chris's neck was a white hand towel. To the left and rear of Chris, I found a clear bottle with a small amount of orange liquid. 
I'm pretty sure Lieutenant Powell's report said it was a greenish colored liquid. I'm gonna go back and I'll put a screenshot of that side by side with this right here. But here it says a clear bottle with a small amount of orange liquid and a box of supplements, which we collected for further processing. To the left of Chris's body, next to the entrance of the gym, there was a wine bottle, which was also collected for processing. Upon completion of the viewing of the bodies, Lieutenant Powell instructed me to photograph the entire interior of the residence with a digital camera. I photographed the entire residence starting from the downstairs and worked my way to the other two levels of the residence. I also collected the answering machine, the phone, and a camera off of the counter in the kitchen for evidence. In the trash compactor in the kitchen, to the right of the sink, a sock with hair, suspected blood, and tape were found. I collected this item for processing and evidence. Once Young's Moving Service arrived, which was the moving service designated by the Fayette County Assistant Coroner to take the bodies to the state crime lab, which, remember, we've got to look closer at that. Lieutenant Powell instructed me to photograph the bodies in further detail while they were being prepared to move. The first body that was moved was that of Nancy Benoit. The assistant coroner, B. Huddleston, removed the blanket that was covering Nancy, and it was found that Nancy's hands and feet were bound also. Nancy's feet were bound with black tape, and on top of the tape was a black wire tied in a knot. Her hands were bound with the same piece of coax cable that was around her neck. The second body that was moved was that of Chris Benoit. I photographed with a digital camera the device that Chris used to hang himself. Underneath the towel that was around his neck, the skin was pinched from the pressure of the wire around his neck. The only signs of trauma to Chris's body was a mark on the bridge of his nose and a mark on his inner left hand in between his thumb and index finger. So again, I'm People who are still stuck on the idea that he brutally murdered Nancy, um, did she just allow him to do it? I mean, she wasn't just, you know, a shrinking violet. She was, I mean, she was woman. I mean, come on. She was not helpless. Anyway, um, the last body that was moved was Daniel Benoit. Daniel was also photographed with a digital camera in further detail. While Daniel was being loaded onto the stretcher to be taken to the transport vehicle, Lieutenant Powell lifted the side bed shirting up near the head of the bed and located a black-handled chef's knife. I photographed the knife with a digital camera, and then Deputy Sheriff Harris collected the knife for processing and evidence. That's the end of this report, but, um, and that's why I said in the first part of part six, when we first mentioned that knife, I said, remember that. And here's why. On the 25th, remember, report date, June 25th, we have Deputy Sergeant Russell in his report saying that Deputy Sergeant Harris collected the knife for processing and evidence. And I'm telling you right now, on June 25th, no, she didn't. She did not collect that knife, which I found completely, um, un I, w I could not believe that. I couldn't believe it. They didn't collect the knife. And I know they didn't collect the knife because it says it in here. We'll go there now. Okay, so here we are. And, um, these additional property located sections, so they're just kind of, kind of randomly scattered through here. Here we have on Thursday, June 28th. The family of Nancy Benoit, Paul and Maureen Tofaloni, asked if someone could meet with them at 130 Green Meadow Lane, which is the home, the Benoit residence. Investigator Mary Harris responded and learned that the family located several items of concern inside a suitcase belonging to Chris Benoit. The suitcase was located inside the mudroom. And this is the suitcase, which I'm going to have to go back and check when it was. One of the investigators in the report walked right past these suitcases inside the door in the mudroom and noted that they, quote, seemed 
to be empty. Well, how thorough and how complete of an investigation went on here? If they just walk past things and say, well, it seemed like it wasn't anything of concern. And then days later, after you're like clearing the crime scene, it's like, okay, crimes, we got everything we need. And you allow the family to enter and basically live in the home. And you have the family calling you, telling you to come back. And what did they find in the suitcase in the mudroom? Conveniently, investigator Harris finds items which included a black workout style glove that contained three orange capped syringes, five wrapped syringes, one Jones pharmacy bag, and one good neighbor pharmacy bag. Now, how do we know? I mean no disrespect to Nancy's family. I'm not suggesting that they planted this evidence. But what I'm saying is there's a big problem with the chain of custody here as far as knowing that the, that that stuff was inside that bag when there was nobody else in that home except for three dead bodies. There's no you you can't I mean how can you how can you prove that at this point? And what else were they called back for? On Tuesday, July 3rd, Investigator Harris returned again to the home. Why? To collect the black handle knife from under Daniel's bed. So this was noted in the report on the 25th, the day they were called to the home for the welfare check, that they found these bodies. They find this black handled knife under Daniel's bed. They say in their reports they collect it for evidence on the 25th. But here we have Tuesday, July 3rd. That's over a week. A week? That, that knife was laying there. The knife was collected from exactly the same position it was photographed in on June 26, 2007. The knife was collected for further analysis in order to confirm Lieutenant Powell's initial determination that there was no evidentiary value to the knife. Well, I mean, this is the same Lieutenant Powell whose great and infinite experience was to transport the bodies as is and whoops, sort of lost some evidence between the crime scene and the crime lab. So th that's what we're dealing with here. Come on now. <laughs> would this be acceptable in any courtroom? Would this, would this jive? I'm not so sure it would. And moving on. On Monday, July 9th, I responded to 130 Green Meadow Lane to meet with Paul Tofoloni about items located in a bedroom of the home. Paul Tofoloni stated, while going through the residence, they located several items hidden in a box in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I collected the items from Paul Tofoloni, which included three medication bottles in the name of Chris Benoit and one capped needle. The first prescription bottle was labeled hydrocodone, 10 slash 650 milligrams, Lorset, prescribed by Dr. Phil Astin and filled on June 8, 2007. The bottle originally contained 120 tablets and was empty when it was located. The second prescription bottle was labeled carisoprodol, 350 milligrams, Soma, prescribed by Dr. Astin and filled on May 24, 2007. The bottle originally contained 100 tablets and was empty when it was located. The third prescription bottle was labeled Propecia 1 milligram, prescribed by Dr. Astin and filled on June 8, 2007. The bottle originally contained 30 tablets and contained 16 tablets when it was located. But what else do we have? Then on July 11th, so they're, they're still coming back. Weeks later, weeks after they allow Nancy's family to live in the home, the family is still calling police to come back to the home to collect evidence. So on Wednesday, July 11th, investigator Mary Harris met with the Tofaloni family and collected a prescription bottle labeled hydrocodone, 10 650 milligrams Lorset, a prescription bottle labeled Propecia, 1 milligram, which is for hair loss. Um, prescription bottle labeled sertraline, 25 milligrams, Zoloft, one black cassette tape, and one black 8 millimeter videotape. The cassette tape contained voicemail recordings of a law enforcement officer leaving Chris Benoit a message concerning a mail-order pharmacy he was familiar with. The message was consistent with a phone call received during the investigation advising Chris Benoit's name surfaced as a customer of a mail-order pharmacy business that was selling steroid products and the videotape contained footage of a busted pipe and water leak filmed by Chris Benoit, showing a contractor pointing out possible causes and remedies. So, okay. 
To me, that's pretty irresponsible. I mean, I could think of a lot of words to use to describe that, but overall, shitty is the thing. I mean, imagine that this was your family. Would this be okay with you? It's not okay with me, and this isn't my family. I just feel like... Well, I have a lot of theories as to why certain things were done certain ways, and I will make a video where I just discuss theories that I have. But first, we need to get through these reports, so we'll see how much more we can do. Okay, so next we're going to look at Deputy Sergeant Mary J. Harris's summary. Report date 625. On 62507, at approximately 1550 hours, which would be 3.50 p.m., I was requested by Lieutenant Trey Powell to respond to 130 Green Meadow Lane in reference to an apparent murder-slash-suicide at that location. When I arrived on the scene, I was met by Lieutenant Powell, who explained to me that Fayette County 911 had received a call requesting a welfare check on the Benoit family after numerous failed attempts to make contact. When Deputy Donna Mundy arrived on the scene, she was unable to gain access due to an auto gate and two large canines. Dispatch notified a key holder that responded and let the deputies in and secured the canines. Well, <laughs> that is uh, lacking in a few details. Check out part two for more on that. While clearing the residence, the bodies of Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel were discovered. It was my responsibility at the time of my arrival to assist Lieutenant Powell in collecting all evidence pertinent to the case. See chains of custody relating to this date. All Fayette County deputies, with the exception of Detective Fenimore, cleared the scene at approximately 2150 hours. So, okay, the other reports said Detective Fenimore and a few other deputies because I wanted to know who they were. Now, this says all Fayette County deputies, with the exception of Detective Fenimore, cleared the scene at approximately 2150 hours. I don't like that. I don't like that they all left and left one guy, maybe one guy and a couple others, in the, in the home overnight. And I was also disturbed by this when I looked at Detective Fenimore's report, and there's no comments in the report about what he did in that home during the overnight hours. You know, not even a little paragraph that says, I remained in the residence overnight to secure the residence, and there were no incidences to be reported. There's nothing. I don't like that. That's suspicious as you know what. Moving on. On June 26, 2007, and oh, here we go, with all of this, I returned to the home stuff. I returned back to the Benoit home at approximately 0938 hours or 938 a.m. to assist further in the collection of evidence. See chains of custody relating to evidence collected on this date. On 6-27-2007, I was requested by Detective Ethan Harper to go with him to the Wachovia Bank located at Peachtree Parkway and Georgia Highway 74 where the Benoit's safety deposit box was located. And we will look into that. We still have so much to get through. We have the rest of these crime scene unit reports, the safety deposit box search, the autopsy. We have, um... The, they talk to the pastor about the Bibles and the Wikipedia mystery. There's so much in here. But I digress. Let's stick to this for now. When I arrived on scene, I was asked to photograph, collect, and document all contents of the box. See chains of custody relating to evidence collected this date. And all of that is in here. And we'll get through it all, I promise. As many videos as I have to make, I am getting this out there to people to see. Um, on 6-28-2007, I returned to the home to retrieve several more items of interest from the family of Nancy Benoit. They had found a black glove with several syringes in it. We also picked up two prescription bags with patient information on it. All these items were found in the suitcase belonging to Chris Benoit, C chain of custody. And we did just look at the additional property located sections of the report. On July 3rd, 2007, 
I returned to the home with Detective Bo Turner. While I was there, oh, here we go, I retrieved a long black handled knife from beneath Daniel Benoit's bed. The knife had been located the day that the bodies were found, but due to the inspection on Daniel's body and the assistance in his body's removal, you know, the knife had not been picked up and placed into evidence at that time. See chain of custody. I <laughs> just for real people. Come on. On 7-11-2007, I was asked to return to the Benoit residence to pick up more medication bottles that were found in a box that was located in the walk-in closet of Megan Benoit's room. See chain of custody and oh shit. When I read that, there's no doubt anymore that somebody, probably both of them, had a problem with these prescription pain pills. And I think that I mean, when something like this happens, you have to ask yourself who benefits. And in this instance, clearly the use and abuse of opioid medication got swept under the rug. Clearly, that was not meant to ever be the issue here. I mean, since then, the opioid industry has had quite a boom. And this Dr. Aston was not the first doctor, and he sure as hell is not the last to be overprescribing these prescription medications. So who did this benefit, having all of this opioid prescription stuff just being kept out of the media? Definitely the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors who are overprescribing these prescriptions. Did that have something to do with why steroid abuse was falsely pushed to the front and why this was so sensationalized as roid rage while the opioid problem was sort of just tossed aside? Who knows? What I do know is that I find it really freaking strange that the Dark Side of the Ring episodes never once mention any of these opioid prescriptions being found in the home, never once mentioned Dr. Aston being raided and standing trial and pleading guilty to overprescribing these medications, not once. Who benefits? And who knows, if we look closer, what we will find. Will we find perhaps Eddie Guerrero's death was related to opioid prescriptions? We know Miss Elizabeth overdosed on opioids, right? We know that. What about Mike Durham? For goodness sake, they even mention Mike Durham in, I think, part two of the Dark Side of the Ring Benoit episode, but they conveniently leave out any mention that he also overdosed from being prescribed opioids by Dr. Aston. So what will we find if we really look closer at what was happening inside the WWE? And I would also just like to add, I'm feeling really happy. I'm not suicidal. So if anything happens to me, sideways looking at you, Mr. McMahon. But enough of that. Before I get myself assassinated, let's finish this up. On 8-17-2007, a small black roll of tape was found inside the trash container that was collected the day of the reported incident. The tape was placed into evidence. See chains of custody. And then that signed Mary Harris, approving officer Trey Powell, and we already went through Deputy Sergeant Russell. Because as you can see, now we're right back to Holly Schrepfer and Pam Clark's statements. And we already went through those in part three. Link below. So we have a few more to go through. Those three that we did today were the three who collected evidence with Lieutenant Trey Powell, who was the first report that we looked through in the first part to part six. And then coming up in the next part, we will look at some of the other detectives, Detective Lee, Detective Howard, Detective Hergesel, Detective Turner, Detective Fenimore, and Detective Shelton. And we're going to keep going till we get through them. But that's it for now because I want to start editing this and get this out there to you. So, and like I said in the intro, I am going to leave in the description box below a link to uh, my Cash App tag. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. If anyone would like to make a donation or a contribution to my channel, any little bit would go a long way and be greatly appreciated. 
that's it for now. Thank you for watching. You know the drill. Give me a thumbs up, share this with anyone you think might be interested in it, and subscribe. Why not? But that's all that I have for you today. This has been Ann Kay. Thank you for watching and hope you have a great day. Bye!